We just went through Hurricane Michael, if you didn't know, which caused serious damage to many homes and other structures. Some was due to storm surge and fallen trees, as was the case in Port St. Joe. Some buildings were damaged due to intense winds and storm surge, as was the case in Mexico Beach. One of my churches, Our Lady of Guadalupe in Mexico Beach, had the roof completely cave in and had a wall fall down. Uh, and we have some pictures here. Interestingly, at least one building in the area survived, apparently unscathed. <clears throat> and uh, if you all out there want to check out this out further, uh, there's a New York Times story. Uh, among the ruins of Mexico Beach stands one house built for the big one. And uh, it's fascinating reading if you're into this kind of stuff. I know you all are most familiar with building codes for the Northeast, but I would love to hear you all discuss what goes into making a building hurricane resistant and why they work. Love the podcast. God bless. Father Chris Winklejohn of St. Joseph Catholic Church and Our Lady of Guadalupe Mission, Port St. Joe, Florida. And this could be none more of a timely question. I know that's bad English, but right. Certainly. I mean, uh, you know, he, he mentions that uh, we might have different different uh, concerns up here, but really the, these hurricanes travel all the way up the coast. And we so had Sandy, right? And uh, that decimated many homes in our area. Mm -hmm. And uh, here's the house that, oh, that's this, this church, right? Yeah. yeah. Is that a Sebring? Crushed Sebring? <laughs> and this yeah. is the house that uh, Father is talking about here. Yeah. And you, you know more about this house than I do. Uh, I know a little bit about it. I don't know a ton about it, but I know, so... This thing has uh, basically concrete columns that go about 28 feet below grade. What? Yeah. They go way deep. They're 40 feet long total, so the house is elevated way above the ground. Um, and there's just miles of rebar, they say, in this thing. It's got impact-resistant windows. It can, I think the windows can take a four-pound projectile at 140 miles an hour without shattering. Um, and the idea is, uh, I'm sorry to interrupt you, but yeah. uh, on these elevated houses is that the lower part of the structure is meant to be sacrificial, right? So if you have an intense storm surge, that stuff gets washed away. Presumably the rest of the house where you live in stays above the water, right? Well, yeah. So when you say the lower part of the structure, you mean any of the surfaces, the, the actual pilings are meant, maybe there's breakaway walls or something like that. But, right, Matt? Uh, yeah, there, were some, there was a breakaway wall, and I, I believe the stairs to the structure were also breakaway, so that when the storm surge hit those, it just ripped them right off, and it didn't compromise the rest of the structure. And the idea is that you, if you allow the free movement of the water, that it's not going to um, push the house over. Right. It, and, you know, I was doing a little bit of reading about, uh, you know, it's... What was it? Katrina was what? 1992 was that? Uh, 2005, I oh, no, think. What am I thinking of? What was 92? Yeah. There was a big... Uh, Andrew. Big, Andrew, mm. Andrew. That's what it was. Um, people were really starting to do some serious research. There were no codes, and they're still in a lot of areas, uh, aren't as strict codes about this sort of thing, but people are waking up and, and, and being mandated to build at least to minimize the damage in these storms. But there's and if you feel like it can't be done, well, you just have to look at this house, and it's pro yeah. it's tr it proves that the concepts are sound. Mm -hmm. Sure. So there's been a lot of research, uh, particularly with government agencies and universities around the country and around the world on on these topics, and there are there's plenty of research out there with proven, tested methods to build houses that can withstand these storms better. the The tough question is what's the, you know, what's the balance of cost versus um, potential risk, potential risk. So uh, a house like this, the average, the, the one in the New York Times article, the average person isn't going to invest that much money because they're going to think, well, I've got insurance on, on, on the house that'll cover some of it. So maybe you have to try to, you have to sort of look at your financial situation and your risk of, of where you are and strike a balance between how much damage it's going to do to the house and and how much it's going to cost you out of pocket. So yeah. you did some research, Matt. What this this pro what this project cost as a premium versus the homes built all around it. Right. So uh, it was about twice as much per square foot to build this house. So we're assuming this house is worth hundreds of thousands of dollars, given where it is. So yeah, I think it was uh, for tax assessment purposes. It's like four hundred thousand dollars, but I would say they probably <laughs> spent closer to eight hundred thousand, maybe building the house, and it's you know because it's assessed on square footage and all that. 
So that's the assessed. that's the the, the, diff, the difficulty for folks is when the house is finished, it needs to appraise for a certain value, and if you spend twice as much as what it's valued at, like where does that money come from? Right. Yeah. I I, I think I read something. I think that a house that has you know all these hurricane protection uh, you know measures built in uh, it will sell for more, but it's not significantly more. It's not twice as much. It's like 7%. Yeah, that's not so enough. So it's just not enough to make it worth it, well, I don't think. But then you got to also consider the insurance costs. Because right. Because yeah. as these storms happen more and more, the insurance so I would companies lo- start... I would love to know, though, if this house had lower insurance rates than the ones around it. I have difficulty believing that it's much different. It should now, I would I think. I think it would, too. <laughs> it's already been proved. <laughs> so what what is different about this house, Matt, than the, the ones that blew away all around it? It's... Uh, well, one, as far as I understand, it has concrete walls, tons of rebar. Uh, so it's the, all concrete? It, as far as I know, it's uh, the walls are all concrete. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And then the roof is, you know, anchored to that um, basically all the way down to the foundation. You know, there's a continuous load path, just like you would have, you know, a continuous load path going to the ground, uh, you know, to hold the roof up. You have a continuous load path to basically hold the roof down. Interesting. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and then they've also they had also kind of minimized the the extensions of the porch. Um, they were going to have a balcony. They took that off. Uh, there were uh, various things that they left off basically to make it. Also the overhangs. They, he wanted deeper overhangs on the roof, but the the builder was like, "You want a hurricane proof house? <laughs> you got to have shallower overhangs." Well, that that kind of takes me back to some of the research that I was doing, and a lot of it comes down to materials and connections. I mean, you, you want you want a continuous connection from the foundation all the way up to the roof and there's there's hardware or struct you know methods to uh to make that happen um obviously in this case they're also choosing materials that can withstand certain levels of forces but uh have- shape shape plays a big part into this the hip yeah. roofs hip roofs as opposed to gable roofs because mm-hmm. the wind can flow over it better um and what you were saying patrick earlier about the space underneath uh in a lot of these designs, that's also for wind, not just for water, so that the wind will actually flow around the house and not create these pressure dif- differentials that end up blowing the roofs off of the houses. So that's yeah. something we should tell folks. One of the um, greatest uh, impacts on whether a, a house will survive a high wind event, whether it's a hurricane or a t- tornado, what have you, is the windows and doors need to remain intact. And uh, if, if, they ha- if there's a failure, if there's a breach in the building envelope, uh, it gets pressurized and they literally blow apart. Yeah, they that's blow when up. the roof comes off, yeah. like immediately. The door blows in, the roof is gone like a second later. <laughs> so key to the survivability of, of these kind of storms is having uh, windows and doors that are super sturdy. Or, mm-hmm. or shutters. Or short, yeah. this, this structure seems to have both. Yeah. What else yeah. is uh, key to having your... Uh, structure survive one of these events? I'm sure there's a lot more. Yeah, (laughs) luck. But I mean, in addition to the shape, I mean, you know, I read some stuff about like the shape of those pilings. You know, these are are just square. Yeah. But if they're round or triangular and, you know, the point of that triangle is facing toward the surf, then that can also help direct water away. Um, But I mean, in this case, the windows, uh, I think two of them broke on the outside, but the inside panes remained intact. So they were able to take, you know, these basically huge projectiles that are flying through the air, you know, driven by 155 mile an hour winds. And, uh, you know, the 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 fact that those windows stayed intact is is really what kind of kept that house together, I think, at the end of the day. And I, I, I wasn't joking when I said luck because, you know, all of this doesn't matter if the house is hit by a barge or, you know, something else that's going to breach it, you know, th- yeah. and that happens, right? Yeah, it's mm-hmm. kind of it's like the same thing you have to think about when you're driving on the road. Uh, you know, I'm a safe driver, I think, but it's it's the things that are going to hit you that are the problem. Yeah. And, and then the, that's the same in this. Uh, what is it, a two by four going? I forget what the, how fast. 70, 70 miles 70 an hour, miles right? An hour can go. I, I was watching on that fortified website. We'll mention that in a bit, but uh, uh, there were some videos of testing in some lab of uh, this is wind. To- totally worth watching. Yeah, I showed we, it to we, Matt we this morning. Have, we definitely have to put a link to that on the website. But the, it's it's this giant, what looks like an airplane hangar that I can't even imagine how big the fan is. They don't show it in the videos, and they're going from 45 up to 140 miles per hour winds against some 
mocked up houses and showing the difference of structures and how so, they behave. So this uh, in- Insurance Institute for Business and Home Safety uh, tests building assemblies for perhaps the very selfish reason that insurance companies are trying to minimize their losses, but it has the added benefit of saving lives and property. So mm-hmm. they build houses in this big warehouse and then they try and blow them down. Yeah. yeah, and it's it's. I mean, it's, <laughs> it's dramatic. It's sad, it would be sad if you were watching a picture of someone else, someone's actual house, but it's fascinating and and really scary, quite scary and and unbelievable what you see actually happening. Like you see in one of them, the the roof peels back right off the bat, and instantly it looks like someone's shooting uh, something out of a cotton candy machine. That these. All the fiberglass just vaporizes <laughs> and starts flying through the air. It's, it's super cool. Yeah. And uh, some of the failures, uh, you see the front door blow in, and then the house just explodes, right? Because it gets pressurized with that wind. And yeah. Yeah. So they have this, that institute that you're talking about, the Insurance Institute for Business and Home Safety. They've got something they call the Fortified Home Program. And it has sort of three different levels. They've got like a, a bronze you know, silver, gold standard for building, uh, really for a bunch of different things. They've got, you know, so, for high wind zones, and they've got one for So they region-specific, well. Matt, or are the recommendations the same for all houses it, throughout the country? It really depends on, on where your you're wind at. zone. What the, yeah, where what the risk at. is. Yeah, so okay. if you're in a high wind zone area, you'll do certain things. You know, mm-hmm. basically most of that's geared toward your roof. And in hurricane zones, you know, the different levels, they handle different things. Um, the, the, the bronze standard is really for your Category 1, storm areas and it goes up to the gold standard is really only for category three storms and this was a category four storm so almost five uh, yeah almost five yeah. exactly so it, whether or not these things you know these measures in fortified home would have saved one of those houses is you know maybe a little bit questionable but it's a lot less expensive um i think if you go with their their gold standard it'll add probably about thirty thousand dollars to that's what they say that's what they say yeah to the cost of a house and and one thing um they point out and and a lot of other government agencies and people testing this stuff point out is that the goal is not always to save the entire house to minim but to minimize the damage to minimize the cost of the damage so some of these programs have recommendations that are really primarily focused on retaining the roof and minimizing water intrusion. And it's easy stuff, mm-hmm. right? Yeah. Uh, comparatively. Uh, yeah. I, I mean, a lot of these things, I mean, really, even for the Category 1 hurricanes, a lot of it is like bolstering, like doing things to strengthen gable end walls. So, I mean, to me right there, that says don't have gable end walls. Yeah. <laughs> build right. a hip roof. Yeah. If you live in a high wind zone, build a, a hip roof. It'll last. I, uh, after uh, Andrew, um, I got a job at Pittsburgh Habitat for Humanity. And because of the uh, monumental destruction of uh, Miami area, Homestead, Florida, after Andrew, um, the habitat down there had this giant infusion of cash, right, to rebuild structures. And... Um, nearly all of the one, uh, so I went down there as part of a group from Pittsburgh to a learn how to gear up for a much bigger uh, a building, like as far as scale, like going from a you know dozen homes a year to hundreds. Um, and so we went down there to learn that stuff and then help out on the building. And nearly all of these very modest homes had uh, hip roofs for that very reason, mm-hmm. and tons and tons of metal connectors to do what you describe, which is to keep. Uh, the load path c- consistent so in the high winds that the house stays stuck to the foundation. Yeah, because instead of being a compression path, I mean, that's a, that's a tension path. Yeah. So you need connectors that can and withstand steel. tons of, yeah. you know, of uplift. Well, yeah. w- one thing, you know, we pointed out earlier in those videos, talking about those videos of those housings, houses being tested is um, they a lot of those houses, especially down in Florida and the Gulf Coast region, have these very flimsy porch roofs attached to them because they don't have to worry about snow loads. And as long as they're not, they don't have a major wind event, they're, they're, they're fine. The, the rain's not going to hurt yeah. it. But um, depending on how those things are braced and how they are attached to the house can have a big effect on how the house itself survives. Because I, there was one that they had firmly attached it to the house, to the sheathing, and not firmly attached the posts to the ground. And it literally acted like a can opener and it, it it acted like a kite and lifted the roof sheathing right off of the house. Yeah. 
So that's definitely a takeaway is make sure that everything is very well connected to the ground, mm -hmm. no yeah. matter where you build, right? Yep. Now, I want to talk about, you know, the, uh, the, the pastor, the father was asking for help. How do I figure out how to, what to do on my own place? And we've offered a lot of insight into what the problems are. But one thing I want to point out is that FEMA, if you go to FEMA.gov, there are a lot of resources that talk about not only how to do this stuff, but how to get the funding to do this stuff. And there are even grant programs in a lot of areas that are either federal st or state grants. Maybe there's some local ones too, particularly in Florida and other Gulf, Gulf region uh, states. And uh, also go to your uh, local large universities because they're the ones who are do doing a lot of the research on this. And their goal is to help people out. So uh, I'd say the uh, Insurance Institute for Business and Home Safety too. I would totally look at their mm -hmm. uh, re recommendations. Yeah, this is going to be a you know a problem going forward. Uh, and you know it used to be, and my uh, one of my former bosses pointed this out to me that until pretty recently, if you built uh, a structure on the coast, whether it be the Gulf Coast or the Atlantic Coast or the Pacific Coast. Uh, those structures were very simple. They were beach shacks, and they blew away. And then next year, uh, <laughs> folks would come back with their friends in a pickup truck and rebuild them. But, but now the most expensive real estate in the country is on the coast. Yep. And so we all, as a society, pay for the cost to rebuild these places when they're destroyed. And I'm not saying that people shouldn't live on the coast, but we got to do a better job of making the st structures survive these storms because the, you know, um, the costs are astronomical to rebuild after these events. Yeah, and, you, f you figure a lot of these are on barrier islands, which are basically sandbars, and they move with the storms, yeah. and they're constantly working to try to bolster the, the barrier islands. I remember there was a town on the south shore of Long Island, I think out in the Hamptons, that had gotten, they'd been bailed out so many times, their roads washed out, the bridges washed out, houses knocked down, that they were told, you know, you're not going to get any more help from, from I forget what it was, the town or the county or the state, and they basically seceded from their town or uh, in order to be responsible for their own cleanup. But this was a wealthy community where these people, a house got knocked down and they move right in and build it back out, mm. back up because they want, they want, they were, it was worth it to them to, to live in that location. I also went down to uh, the Gulf Coast after. Um, Katrina a year later to uh, survey the reconstruction um, effort for the magazine I was working at at the time. And um, this, this kind of storm really changes the fabric of a community. What on, you know, in Biloxi, there was a lot of very middle and working class homes close to the, the Gulf. And when the reconstruction started, they all became concrete high rises because folks just couldn't afford to build there anymore. So it's a, it's a, it's a big question and, and I don't know that we'll get to the bottom of it today, but thanks to the father for writing to us and asking, mm. you got luck. anything to say? No, just good luck. Yeah. yeah. It's, and, uh, you're, we're thinking about you father and the rest of you down there and, uh, hopefully we'll get some. Uh, guidance on how to build to survive these storms, which seem like they're increasingly common. Yeah.